Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's uh, time to start, and I'd like to welcome you all here. My name is Donald Cryan. I'm the chairman of the Inner Temple History Society. Some time ago, I was also the master of the silver here. So I have a considerable personal interest in the silver. The uh, talk this evening is the first in an informal series of talks about various aspects of the Inner Temple, its history over the last 750 years, uh, as reference to its possessions, its buildings and its activities. Further talks are planned for later in the year. Uh, there will be a talk on three of the treasures from the Inner Temple Library, given by the extremely eminent uh, legal historian, Professor Sir John Baker. Uh, and then uh, the final talk in the year will be a talk on the Inner Temple Library, uh, which will be given by the, the master of the library and the librarian. Uh, and uh, uh, that uh, will complete that set. Uh, in uh, the, the next year, um, I hope to have uh, people talking about the uh, landscape of the inn in the 19th century, which is interesting, uh, and uh, various other topics of the officers uh, who uh, uh, dealt with the, the way the inn worked uh, throughout its history. So, the, uh, this evening, we have the uh, inestimable benefit of having Richard Parsons talking to us. Uh, Richard, who is the silver advisor to the inn and has been the silver advisor for the last three decades, he, he knows everything there is to know about the silver in the inn. Uh, and uh, the problem with this evening's talk must have been for him to decide which pieces of silver he wanted to talk about. Uh, his knowledge is such, and indeed our collection is such, that um, it would merit much more uh, than the uh, single talk that we've got this evening. The uh, numbers we have here uh, are heartening. Uh, we have twice as many people online, but that's the way things have developed since COVID. And um, Richard has been kind enough to say that he will take questions from the audience here, but also um, if those who are watching online would care to use the Q&A um, facility online, I will do the best I can to uh, work out which of their questions uh, would best be uh, dealt with by Richard in the time available. So Richard, thank you very much, over to you. Good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to talk to you tonight about some of the inn's treasures and the part they played in the history of the inner temple. The plate, the name for collected silver and not electroplate, of the inner temple consists of both religious and secular items. The ecclesiastical silver and silver gilt plate used in the temple church is jointly owned by the inner and middle temples. Both inns have their own collections of secular plate that is used for dining and display purposes, much like other city institutions and Oxford and Cambridge colleges. Interestingly, because of the depth of mature education given to students, the inner temple or the temple might even have been considered to be the third university in early times. The Inner Temple collection is wide ranging and many of the important pieces can be seen in the Great Hall display showcase. This evening, we're considering plate that helps to explain the historical association and development of the inn combined with Royal Association and the temple church. Generally, the chosen items are chronologically presented. And one of the pieces is so important 
that it's been included because it links other matters. The earliest piece of hollowware in the collection is the silver gilt melon cup. It might help also just to show you here, this is not the actual cup you see on the screen. This is a Victorian copy, but I wanted you to see it so it gives you some idea of the scale of the cup. So this melon cup stands 10 and 3 quarter inches tall and weighs 37.4 ounces made in London and hallmarked in 1563-64. It's engraved with the Pegasus badge. There is some debate whether this cup has been in the hands of the Inner Temple since 1563, or whether it was acquired at a later date. On the 1st of May, 1563, there is mention of a communion cup to be made for the church being co-funded by the Inner and Middle Temples. More about this cup later. Further, four days later on the 5th of May, it is again minuted as order that Mr. Warner's money and 20 pounds for the cup to be recouped out of the debt owned by the society to Mr. Fuller, the late treasurer. 20 pounds at the time would be around 7,000 pounds in today's money. <coughs> so would this have been enough to make the melon cup? I believe it would. To make a similar cup today would cost around seven, maybe 10,000 pounds using current production techniques, a cup like that. Okay. A contemporary communion cup, however, that is also mentioned and shown here, could have been made for considerably less than 20 pounds, I believe. You see the simplicity, the difference in detail? The first mention of the melon cup would appear to have been included in the inventory of 1703-04 with the entry gilt cup with cover. Could this cup have possibly survived the Civil War? In inner temple ownership, when so much silver was lost, we just don't know. Some regard this as being a poppy cup. Why would you wish to drink from a poppy when you can drink from a sweet melon? To me, the cup represents a cantaloupe melon. <laughs> You will see the twisting stem and also shape of the cup body, which very much conforms to the fruit body. This variety of cantaloupe melon arrived in England in the mid 16th century and is mentioned in Hill's Art Garden of 1563, conveniently. Further, the cup bears the maker's mark of Henry Watson who employed European journeymen, one of whom was, Mar one of whom was Maurice van Maiden, who might have bought a pattern book with him. With similar illustration to these sketches by Albrecht Dürer of 1499. And he might have actually made the cup for such a novel design at the time. The final word might be left to the colloquial expression, the cut the melon, to decide a question. In 1607, the inner and middle temples jointly commissioned a gold cup. This was a, a gift to King James I of England and of course, James VI of Scotland. The gift resulted in the two inns receiving their letters patent that granted the temple lands in perpetuity. Royal contact with the inner temple has been evident from earliest times, and perhaps not the earliest, but possible the most important royal connection to the inn 
is mentioned in the general account book of 1607-08. Here an object is described, which I believe no longer exists. Apparently made by the royal goldsmith, John Williams, the, pas the passage records to the king's goldsmith for half the cup, which is to be provided to his majesty, 333 pounds, six shillings and eightpence. The supplement entry for the next year states to the goldsmith for making a cup of gold, which was given to the king with a velvet case, the one half, seven pounds, three shillings. The other half would have been paid by the Middle Temple. The screen shows my sketch of the cup to which I apologize. We haven't been able to get a very detailed picture. But the gold cup, I believe, would have been a very large object. It is recorded to have weighed 200 and a half ounces of gold. A large silver steeple cup of the period would stand 24 inches. So that would have been about that high. And weighed 60 ounces or so. Gold is twice as dense as silver. So this cup, gold cup, would have been a third larger than a silver cup, possibly 36 inches high. The cup was given to James I in 1608 as a New Year's gift. And he reported, uh, uh, it is reported, that he considered it to be one of his richest jewels. <clears throat> he correspondingly granted the letters patent. On the instruction of Charles I, some 20 years later, it would appear that the gold cup went to Holland, possibly in 1629, with much other treasure. Or it was accompanied by the rest of the crown jewels and further royal treasure with the Queen and the Princess Royal in 1642, when they traveled to Holland for safety and to help secure a loan for the Royalist cause in the Civil War. The crown jewels returned later to be eventually destroyed by Oliver Cromwell, but it seems not the Temple Cup. Still, it looks like a particularly good deal to have secured the Temple lands in this way. In today's money, 673 pounds would have a value of about 333,000 pounds. Conversely, if we take the price of gold today, 205 ounces will cost approximately 300,000 pounds. And if we say the cost to make this cup is 30,000 pounds, not much has changed over the last 400 years. The value of the temple estate is certainly worth a great deal more than in 1608. I'll show you this a moment, this, and, and you can feel it afterwards because holding a gold object, probably not many of you have done, but you'll see it's very warm. Uh, this weighs six ounces and uh, that's one thirty-third of the price of the gold cup. Sorry, it's disappeared. This would have probably bought the land that this building stands on, which is a remarkable thought, isn't it? Now, a pair of silver gilt chalices being part of the plate residing in the inner temple church, each standing nine and three quarter inches tall and weighing 20 ounces. And I have one of them here. Each of the chalices are engraved with a Latin inscription, one translated as being George Croke, Armiger, in, in, in other words, he was a knight, treasurer of the inner temple, and Nicholas Overbury, 
treasurer of the Middle Temple, Anno Domini 1610. The other chalice bears a similar inscription, but to the Middle Temple. The account book, volume two, page 53, records 1609 to Terry a goldsmith for two new communion cups for the temple church, a baiting of exchange of one. Now, that one, I think, is possibly the communion cup that I spoke about earlier as being uh, the two cups, the melon cup being the second. So, 13 pounds, 12 shillings and tuppence. The middle temple paid one half, six pounds, 16 shillings and a penny. If one cup, if one cup cost six pounds, 16 shillings and a penny in 1609, it seems most unlikely that the cup of 1563 at a cost of 20 pounds was other than the melon cup. So who was Terry? My view is that the pair of chalices were supplied by the shopkeeping goldsmith in Cheapside, John Terry. Hence the name of Terry mentioned in the Inner Temple records. The chalices, however, bear the maker's mark of a monogram mark, FT, which is not a mark for Terry, but for the actual working goldsmith who made the chalices, probably Thomas Francis. It's remarkable that these silver gilt treasures belonging to the church survived the melting pot at the time of the Civil War. Apparently they were secured in a locked silver box in the church, so they can still be used 400 years after they were made. The silver cross and candlesticks in the inner temple church were less fortunate, they disappeared. A silver layer basket purchased by Sir Marshall Hall, the eminent criminal barrister from Tessier Limited, my old family firm, on the 19th of June, 1925, and presented by five benches to the inn. A massive 29 inches across the handles and weighing 274 ounces or eight and a half kilograms of silver, and afterwards, I've got a kilogram of silver here, so you can also feel how heavy that might be. A layer basket was traditionally given to a woman during her pregnancy and would have contained clothes, etc., for the baby. By any standards, this is an exceptional object made in Holland by Hans Conrad Brechtel. Between November 1644 and November 1645, the Pearson Repousse base is decorated with grapes, vines, birds, animals, and a dominant central coat of arms with a lion and unicorn supporters. The arms depicted here are for the stadtholder of the House of Orange, quartering the British royal arms. The arms being for William II of Orange and his wife, the eldest daughter, Charles I, Mary the Princess Royal. Mary is born on the 4th of November, 1631, and was married in London on the 2nd of May, 1641, at the age of nine. Her husband being 15 year old, was William of Orange. According to the marriage treaty, Mary was to remain in England and she reached her 12th year. Her husband was to allow her 1,500 pounds a year as pocket money. That's generous, isn't it? <laughs> so her turmoil in England caused Mary to be taken to Holland by her mother somewhat earlier than expected in 1642. William himself, now 17, tried to sleep with his 11-year-old bride in June 1643 in contravention of his parents' wishes and was stopped just in time, apparently by a lady in waiting. This caused considerable disharmony 
and a disconnection with the English court in The Hague. A second small marriage ceremony took place in The Hague in November on Mary's 12th birthday. It was not until the following year that Mary was installed in her full conjugal position and was able to give audiences and receive foreign ambassadors and fulfill the functions of the state. This she did with a gravity and decorum that was remarkable for her years. She was also celebrated for her grace, beauty and intelligence, but her general education was described as defective and she found difficulty in writing. It was not possible to say precisely when William and Mary consummated their marriage. Even in the summer of 1644, William had hardly any contact with his wife, treated her badly and had many lovers, amongst them the two daughters of Field Marshal Van Broderer. It is possible that the layout basket was a message to apologize and is more of a marriage basket to encourage and explain the reason why they had to be, there had to be a satisfactory reunion of the two young people. What I would like to do is very briefly explain the elements as I see it in this basket, because I believe there's a message here. And I think Mary, her education in, in the court, uh, in, in The Hague, she would have seen um, the artwork that would have been explained to her and the iconography that was in it. If we have a look here, there's a little squirrel and here's a weasel. The squirrel, of course, is on her side of the arms. This is William, that's Mary. And if we see a division here, it's so she is the squirrel. She's the, the, the sort of virgin woman. Uh, he's the weasel. If he uh, was put in a, a, a close proximity to her, he, he, he would kill her. That's what these animals do. It's like the fox in the chicken run. On either side, you have peacocks. On his side, much larger. Uh, than hers. Uh, there's a certain sort of strutting nature about his peacock and hers, maybe it was supposed to be a female representation. She of course was the nest builder and here he is sort of displaying his feathers, not quite, but could be. Underneath the coat of arms here, difficult to see, there's this auricular mantling that looks to me like a very sad face. And I feel that this is everything that's happened in the past. It's beneath them, it's beneath the arms. And there needs to be a correction here. So if we move a little bit further up, you'll see up here, I believe those are two stalks. And of course the stalks bring the next generation. Her stalk looks decidedly depressed, I think, <laughs> whereas his looks a little more ambitious. And you carry on up the picture, and here you have a bird. And in fact, when you look at it under magnification, above his line, it looks like an owl. He's seen the light. He's realized that he hasn't been behaving properly. And then we get two monkeys. Her monkey's eating grapes, which is a uh, sort of fertile expression. His monkey, he's behaved very badly, it's disappearing. She might have seen Bruegel's uh, picture of the two monkeys and had that explained to her possibly. And then at the top we have a crow and a reed. And the crow is talking through the reed. And that's a sign of victory. The crow is saying, come on, we've got to get together. And so, I, I think this is a message in this basket. It's very difficult to see these little elements are lost in the rich finery that forms the base. But it is a fascinating message. And if I'm right, I'm probably the first person to have read it in 400 years. But now you see it as well. Mm -hmm.
the explanation is entirely mine. But whatever the message, the basket worked. It is certain that Mary miscarried in October 1647 and in November 1650, on the death of her husband with smallpox, she rushed through the palace, wailing and threw herself on his dead body, only to be pulled away by concerned courtiers. Eight days later, she gave birth to a boy who was christened William. And in 1689, after the glorious revolution of 1688, William became King William III of Great Britain. Now we come to dining. Did you hear that? <laughs> the horn was blown before dinner at 11 and supper at six to call people to the hall every day. Tonight, the horn was played for us by Master John West. And perhaps, Master, you could tell us a little bit about the instrument. Well, thank you very much indeed. And thank you, Donald, for asking me to play this. Um, it is something which you all tell me about its history. Uh, but I believe it's the first time it's been played for about 200 years. Um, you can, as a brass player, which I am, uh, get a similar sound out of a piece of post pipe if you put them out. <laughs> and so the thing about this is that it's very short uh, and very brief. Um, a bugle rim, when it's wound out, is about five foot three. Uh, and that can play eight notes, which you know from the last post, which we've recently sadly heard. Uh, and the trumpet, which rolls out, is about six and a half feet, and that can do more notes because of its length. But this thing, as you heard, also, I'm afraid, can only do one note. <laughs> so that's, what, that's what it is and why it is from a technical point of view. But, but Master Cryan, you've, you've heard this played, I believe, 70 years ago. Well, no, not, not, not in fact this one. Oh. Um, uh, because what, what happened was that um, uh, the horn fell into desuetude uh, in the late 19th century uh, uh, for no more um, uh, dramatic a reason than that um, the uh, elderly porter who was uh, charged with playing it uh, felt he didn't have the wind anymore. Uh, and so... It, it, that one wasn't played. Uh, what then happened was that Master McKinnon, who was a famous uh, historian, Lord Justice McKinnon, who was a famous historian of the inn, um, uh, decided that it would be good to restore the horn playing. Uh, and we have the other horn. Which, Richard, are you going to talk about that? May I? Please, yes. <laughs> but thank you very much indeed. I mean, it, was that, it was that second horn that I heard there, of course. Yes, it would be. The practice, the practice of horn blowing finally ceased by the end of Temple about 70 years ago, after a gap of some years, although it was continued by the Middle Temple until more recent times. So it might have been the Middle Temple horn. Do, no, do you think? No, 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 no. Uh, so what, what happened was, that um, uh, although it was discontinued uh, in the uh, uh, 1880s, um, Master McKinnon presented us with the other horn, uh, and um, that was a horn of a different type, which you're, you may want to touch upon, I don't know. Um, but that, that horn um, was played fairly constantly from um, the, just before the last war, uh, certainly into um, our time, that is my, my time as a student at a diner. Um, 
Uh, and when it stopped is an interesting matter. Uh, just a little story, if I may. Um, I asked, um, I don't think you'll mind me, me, me saying this. Uh, our, our great historian here, here Professor uh, John Baker, uh, I, I phoned him up and said, uh, John, when did the, uh, when did they stop playing the horn the second time? Oh, said John, with a certain sense of academic surprise, have they? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Record mention horns having been purchased similar to the two horns shown here in 1621, 1630, and 1673. And now, as you can see, the inn owns two silver-capped horns. The one we've just heard played by Master Wuss has silver mounts made by Thomas Phipp and Edward Robinson in London in the 1780s, and in fact is engraved 1786. The other large, also with silver mounts, which is Hallmark London 1936-37 by an unknown maker WT, indeed was given by Sir Frank McKinnon. The inner temple horn calling finally ceased in 1870. Firstly, I beg your pardon, it firstly ceased in 1870, and Sir Frank campaigned to restore the practice in 1936. Because the head porter made such a poor sound with the 1780s horn, he commissioned another with a reeded mouthpiece to help the blower. Master Wass, thank you very much indeed for your fine performance. <laughs> Master, you may be interested to know that the horn blower was entitled to a pint of beer after a performance. <laughs> so, so we'll see you in the Pegasus bar afterwards. <laughs> An inspection of the early volumes of the calendar of Inner Temple records gives many indications of the equipment needed for dining. There are mentions of the purchase and repair of silver spoons, ewers, and bowls, also supplies of food and linen. Up until the end of the 17th century, dining was a pretty messy business. The table fork was only gradually introduced to Britain from Italy during the end of the century in the late 1680s. The main eating utensils used before that time was a knife for meat, spoon for gravy, combined with the hand. On the high table, the hands would have been washed at the beginning of the meal, sometimes before grace, and at the end of the meal, before the table was left, with a ewer and basin. Those below the salt will wash their hands on entry and on leaving the hall using side bowls. The inn's head silverman, William, uh, tells me that tradition of the youngest server tasting the water to ensure it was not poisoned hasn't happened in his time. <laughs> On Thursday, the 5th of August, 1661, Sir Thomas Hennage Finch, Solicitor General, being reader of the inn, gave his feast in the ancient hall. For this feast, King Charles II was bidden. He came in the royal barge from Whitehall, accompanied by the Duke of York, the Lord Chancellor, various ministers of state, and a great number of the nobility. Perhaps the urine basin used on that occasion was not quite important enough for the next royal visit. So Hennig wanted something a little grander. In 1671, the king and the duke again honored the treasurer, now Sir Hennig, with their presence February the 2nd, Candlemas Day, on which occasion the hall was again arranged for their reception and performance of the committee a comedy by Sir Robert Howard was given for their entertainment by the players of the King's House. Has anyone read the script of the committee? 
Well, I, I have. <laughs> I doubt it's going to be a West End hit today. The large silver ewer and basin shown here, engraved with Sir Henry's initials on the reverse, was made by Thomas Minchell in London and is hallmarked for 1671. To give an idea of the scale, the basin is a diameter of 24 inches and weighs 119 ounces. As a note, one of Minshaw's apprentice, John Clark, did not continue his career as a goldsmith. Instead, he became keeper of the lions at the Tower of London, which was the first menagerie in the city. Actually, there is something a note about that, that um, it, it was not a good job um, because a lot of them, in fact, were savaged by the beasts. <laughs> if this large ewer and basin were placed before the king at each end of the meal with the generously engraved Pegasus coat of arms, surrounded by the elegant feathering mantling so popular at the time, carved on the plain but reflective silver surface, it would have been a most noticeable display of the inn's heraldry, status and wealth, and the culmination of the feast and royal visit. What else might be found on the dining table? The Pegasus salt. The inner temple Pegasus is first mentioned in records of the Christmas revels of 1561. Robert Dudley, the first Earl of Leicester, helped resolve a land dispute in the inner temple's favor between the inner and middle temples. At the time, he was Queen Elizabeth's favorite. And it has been suggested, because he was master of the Queen's horse, that the choice of a Pegasus reflected his association are a re I'm sorry, his association with the inn. One of the most notable manifestations of the Pegasus are the realistically chased table salt cellars. Each of the 16 models stand six inches high and the total weight is 387 ounces. All are formed as a winged horse in flight, supported on the front with a strut that forms part of the scrolling base. With a removable shell dish, which is, with, which is positioned between the wings. Made in the 19th century, all bear the London assay marks, including mid-century date letters. Further, all 16 are engraved on the bases with dates and initials. They were formed by the eminent silversmiths of the age, the Fox brothers, George and Charles. The quality of their work was confirmed by the inclusion of articles made by them in the great exhibition. We now move to modern times. Any dining needs light. And the eminent silversmith, Anthony Elson, has given the hall just that. He has designed and made a series of candelabra and candlesticks for use in the hall. Four candelabra for the millennium in 1999, standing three and a quarter inches high and weighing 408 ounces. Four candelabra for the anniversary of the 400 years charter, gaining made in 2008, that's the central one. And then four candlesticks as a guest gift from Master Deeby in 2011, here. The Millennium Candelabra each have stems formed as four supporting columns, symbolic of the Purbeck marble columns in the temple church, surmounted with interlocking Romanesque arches, standing on a symbolic calyx of the conjunction of the, palette, of the planets Saturn and Jupiter is a representation of the Pegasus. Before 17th century, the event of the occurrence of the two planets was widely supposed to herald 
apoplectic changes. The most recent great conjunction occurring on the 22nd of December, 2020, Brexit occurred in January of that year. The similar 400 celebrated candelabra are made to a slightly smaller form and have a calyx of interlocking thistles as a respect to James VI of Scotland. The four candlesticks each have two demi pagasus rising from the bases. The general height of these candelabra makes for a more relaxed meal. This enables cross table conversation beneath the flames. There would be much more that I'd like to add this evening, but time moves on. And I hope you've enjoyed this talk, whether your interest is historical, about silver, or you just wish to see the new hall extension. I would like to thank Kate, Rosie, Joshua, William for their help in setting up this event. Master Was for the horn blowing and Master Crime for asking me to talk to you this evening. Thank you. Well, Richard, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, having had the benefit of your knowledge uh, over the years as Master of the Silver for a time, some of that I already knew, lots of it I'd already forgotten. Uh, and um, I, I'm very grateful to hear it all again. And that we'll find it, I hope, summarized in the yearbook uh, in, in due course. But for the moment, um, it's time for questions. And I wonder if anybody in the room uh, has any questions. Oh, must get him on. Uh, I've seen the layout basket in the it be in a temple hall, but I hadn't realized its connection with Marshall Hall. Uh, even in 1925, presumably, it was a rather expensive purchase. Do, do you know anything about where he found it, why he bought it, and why he presented it to the inn? Well, he, yes, certainly. Uh, well, he found it in um, my old family business in Bond Street. And we'd had it for a bit of time. And uh, so I expect we really gave it to him for nothing. <laughs> because, because he was quite a clever customer. In fact, he used to come in quite regularly. Um, my father spoke about him um, on, on occasion. And so he bought this basket uh, with uh, five other benches and then presented it to the inn. And I, I do have uh, the original typewritten sheet that came with it um, but I need to look up maybe the inn would like to have that um, because it has some relevance but there was none of the explanation that I've given you at all recorded I don't think anybody you know people people see things but they don't look at things and, and I was guilty of that for many years and I used to think this was a magnificent basket but I never really looked at it. And uh, the, the little animals are so small and they're lost in the detail. And then uh, the basket was going to be displayed in the Hague. There was an exhibition of silver. And so of course, to, um, to prepare that to be sent because we had to get an export license. You've been having a jolly good look at it. And all this began to appear. And then I read about the history of the people that might be associated with it and then it just sort of seemed to fit in but whether you believe it or not is another matter i hope you do but, but it and maybe next time you look at it you'll see it in a rather different light than just a lump of silver because it is i believe a great deal more but richard in, in terms of its uh, significance um for the curators of the exhibition in the hague uh, on uh, Dutch silver um, to bother to ask us to lend it to them. And they must have thought it was uh, a, a piece of real importance. Is that correct? Well, they they thought it was absolutely magnificent. If you look at the catalogue, which is a very fine book, uh, I think you'll find that it is certainly the largest piece that's on display. Um, and and I would think 
certainly one of Brechtel's masterpieces. And uh, it, it will be something that I'm sure the Hague would like to have. But of course, they're not going to have that chance, are they? <laughs> yes, questions. Last thing. I think I can add to that in Hetlow Palace, uh, there is a very similar looking layout. Oh. Uh, and I imagine, I would have thought the two would be put together. I read somewhere, and I can't now remember whether it was in Dutch or in English, that ours was rather superior to the one in Hetlow Palace. Do you know, it's rather interesting because um, her mother, uh, Charles's wife, had been given a layout basket that was bigger than this one. And so, um, yeah, there's no doubt about it that there is a sort of a scale, isn't there? It probably depends how royal you are. <laughs> and it, um, but the fascination is this one was probably, well, who would make it? And it's probably the Winter Queen. Uh, she uh, understood art. Um, she was a patron of the arts. Um, she was um, uh, extravagant and she had no money, which I always think is a wonderful way to live. Um, and she uh, probably saw that something, having had 12 children herself, probably she saw that there was a need for these two young people to get together and that um, having some offspring uh, was very important for, for the two families. So I suspect that um, she might have had a hand in creating this basket. Ms. Master Shiva, thank you very much for that. I think it's, it's very interesting that the, the, the diversity of talent we find amongst our benchers, that we have trumpet players and those who can also read the labels in Dutch. <laughs> Uh, other questions? Um, Richard, was it, is it the Miller, the Miller Cup? Is it a Miller or Melon? Melon. Melon Cup. Yeah. Um, that's the Melon Cup. Before you said about the Melon, and you were quite convincing about that, I'd looked at it and it wondered if it had any connection with perhaps in silver trying to recreate a coconut cup which were extremely popular at the time <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to in any way deflect me from my opinion <laughs> ah, yeah but that is a melon uh, of course coconut yeah but it's not that shape and oh. um, it doesn't have ridges like that Right. This is so, it's just, I mean, it, you, you could say that it was a gourd of some sort, of course, and having seen the uh, Jura sketches, you could maybe say, well, it's, it's, it's just a made up object. Yeah. But I think it, with the stems, very, very similar to the sort of um, uh, support that you would see given to a, uh, a melon, it, it looks like a melon to me. The first time I saw melons growing was in Turkey, and they look like this <laughs> many, many years ago, I might say. But I think that's why I brought one along. <laughs> Size is perfect. Am I convincing? I don't know. <laughs> uh, Richard, I think you were telling me that um, at, the, at the banquet uh, for uh, the, the king and, his, and the Duke of York, um, just before. Uh, 1563, uh, there was reference to much feasting on sweet fruit. Yeah, there was, absolutely. And, and I think the other interesting thing, um, we said it was 1561 mm. that the Pegasus was adopted by the inn. And um, also it's engraved with the Pegasus. Now the, the marks on the outside, the assay marks are quite worn. Um, but there's a wonderful set of marks on the inside, on the inside of the cover, of course, where they're protected. And the engraving of the Pegasus uh, is quite sharp. It's of an early style. And so this is one of the sort of 
questions I asked, well, was it made uh, for the inn in 1563? Mm -hmm. Or um, was it bought in maybe around, uh, I don't know, 1700 or later mm -hmm. um, after the Civil War? We just, we just don't know. So I misspoke just now. You, you, you didn't, of course, say it was for the, for the King and the Duke who said that uh, the sweet fruits were actually at the great Christmas feast for um, when you were telling me um, uh, as you were thinking about this, uh, the great Christmas feast from uh, for Robert Dudley uh, out of Essex. That, that was... I think it was for the later feast, wasn't it? Of uh, the 1671, wasn't it? But... Well, we could... It might have been Dudley. I, I think I, it is I, Dudley. I think you were telling me it was Dudley. Oh, well, all yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I, I'm oh, supporting I'm your sorry. argument. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, next question. Yes. Richard, you mentioned that a lot of um, the silverware um, was melted down during the Civil War. I just wondered the extent to which that was by coercion or whether the owners of the silverware were voluntarily donating it for the cause, whether you'd be able to say anything about that. Well, I know of other institutions where it was forcibly taken. Um, certainly the livery companies were asked, you see, the thing is that uh, a silver object can easily be turned into specie, can be turned into money. And so if somebody says pay up, it's going to be the natural place to find the funds. And so uh, the coercion was give us some money and so you'd look around and you'd give a piece of silver. And certainly um, livery companies, and Oxford colleges, that's what they did. Um, I'm not sure, I can't remember which college it is, but um, it's, it's one of the Cambridge colleges and they have a cup called the Anathema Cup. Have you come across it? Uh, and um, I saw it many, many years ago, 40 years ago, maybe 45 years ago. And um, the cup had no cover. And inside the cup, there was a pen note, a piece of paper. And it just said, the cup's gone to the king. <laughs> and he refused to take the body of the cup because it was called the anathema cup, only the cover. So you see, that's how you got around these things. You sent your cover. <laughs> or maybe you were coerced to send it, I don't know. but. Um, Certainly would, and and the uh, the altar pieces from the temple church <coughs> definitely disappeared. The candlesticks and the uh, the cross, um, and so they were spirited away. They were very visible, of course. Whereas these chaps were put away because those would have been used for a different purpose. They would have only come out, imagine, at the time of communion. But do I do, if I can perhaps ask, do I, absolutely directly, we really haven't got any idea because our records don't uh, show what was happening. And the inns were um, divided um, between the, the parliamentarians and the royalists. Um, at what moment the stuff was taken away and melted down uh, is, is just not known. What is known is that it was there and then it wasn't there. Uh, and um, so we, we had to, to, to get it all together as best we could afterwards. Uh, and the melon cup, of course, is this great, lovely thing of whether it returned or didn't return. Um, uh, Richard, I have a question about the... Well, can I just say something about yeah. that? A few years ago, the Middle Temple found a, a piece of paper in one of their account books that actually describes uh, their silver being taken. Now, we, or the inner temple, we don't have such a piece of paper. Well, if we do, it's hidden somewhere. <laughs> and so, so these things are really interesting. Yeah, indeed. When did things disappear? And uh, I I'm so sorry. No, no. Um, somebody, somebody online, who is it? Um, Mark King um, said uh, that the Anathema Cup is actually at Pembroke College, Cambridge. Ah, it's Pembroke. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, there's a question uh, from, I don't know whether it's from Tim or Christine Cuttle. 
uh, one or t'other, or possibly both, uh, was the large gold cup given to James I just a decorative object, or could it be used for a purpose? It was, it was a lump of metal. It was, it was payment. Uh, and I think just decorative, it would have been, well, I say, I think it would have been a pretty big thing, really. And um, how could you use that? It, it would have stood there on a sideboard somewhere and been very grand, I think. Any other questions? Yes, please. Um, Yes, this question of the silver disappearing, I mean, there is a story, and I think it was an Oxford college, who when the soldiers came said, oh, you don't want ours, the college down the road has much better <laughs> silver, and they went there. Um, but I, I think one of the things which is really now almost forgotten is probably more silver disappeared under William III when Newton became master of the mint and put a offered a really big subsidy on the price of silver to get silver to improve the coinage and probably more silver disappeared with people raising money then than actually did in the civil war and i think that has rather got forgotten thank you that's a very interesting observation i, mean, I could just imagine the middle temple sending them down here to get our silver <laughs> <laughs> well maybe we said that and that's why theirs went. And they, <laughs> perhaps we didn't have any. I know in some of the um, annals it, it, it says that we had plate oh. uh, for meals. So it could have been we didn't have very much anyway. We just had a cup, maybe. <laughs> and a, a, fi a final question. Master's Women. Thank you very much. It's been fascinating. But can I just ask you this? I can imagine it's been incredibly difficult to whittle down from amongst the treasures, the ones that you were going to talk about now. What would have been the next thing? What just got cut <laughs> off the list? Do you know, we have so many wonderful things. We have the Dolben Porringer. We have um, the most wonderful um, patsa with Griblin engraving on it and so on. But, but I think I would have picked something that's in this room. And it's in the showcase over there. And it's a trowel and a mole. And it was used by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II to lay the 1952 stone um, when this building was rebuilt after the Blitz, where it was the original old hall was completely destroyed. And uh, whenever I handled that, I think, well, maybe Her Majesty was perhaps not the last person to hold it, but pretty close to. And it's such a delicate thing. It was made by Leslie Durbin, who was uh, a very fine silversmith uh, of his time. He trained with Omar Ramsden, and he had his own business for many years. Uh, he made a, quite an eclectic uh, display of silver that, that most of his work were for private individuals. He had a retrospective at the Goldsmiths Company in, in, in the 70s. And if you see the catalog, it will give you a good idea of the sort of work that he produced. But I think that is, that is just such a lovely thing. It's so delicate. Uh, you couldn't get much cement on it. Um, but it obviously did its job because here is the building still. And the other thing I like about it, of course, is that his daughter, the Princess Royal, another Princess Royal, not the one from the basket, she was here last year and she opened this wonderful suite of rooms of which you're sitting in one. And so it really goes full circle in a way, doesn't it? And, and another reason why I bought the basket in, but I would have liked to have had time to include that because I think it's so simple, but so much of the core of the silver that the that the inner temple has. Yeah, well, well, Richard, it's 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 time for the wine. <laughs> oh, uh, and, and in, in Master Boss's case, for beer. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, th that was absolutely fascinating. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, I'm most grateful to you for doing so much work. Of, I know how much work you've done on this, uh, and I'm very, very grateful to you, and I'm sure we all found it enormously interesting. There have been questions about whether or not it would be uh, published, um, and um, the answer is yes, it will be in, in the yearbook, or a summary of it will be in, in the yearbook, uh, and uh, I hope you'll give us a, a hand doing that. But Richard, thank you so much.